How's it going? Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good. You're Kyle. Nice to meet you, Kyle. I'm Adam. Nice to meet you, Adam. All right. Let's see if we can all get in this shot. I apologize. We are just working off my laptop. Oh, you're fine. Get a more sophisticated setup going, but I think we're going to make it work. Let's see if... <laughs> you're making history here, Kyle. <laughs> no way. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I thought we were all going to do all different Zooms. Oh, no. It actually, uh, here. as soon as you asked me if it would be cool if the others joined, I used it as a vehicle to uh, force these two to come to my home. Oh, so my gosh. You helped I was us not expecting you. this. <laughs> I hope it's okay. Oh, no, no. Definitely. Definitely. It'd be even better. I think the fans would be very uh, enraged right now or very just ecstatic. Nice. Um, you do it all for the fans. <laughs> Introduce you guys yourself to the, the listeners. Uh, I'm Adam Demersion. Uh, I uh, played guitar and sang in the Brave Little Abacus. Uh, I'm currently a musician in the Boston area in a band called Me and Capri's. Uh, my name is Zach Kelly Onet. I played synth in the Brave Little Abacus, and um, I write music, um, a lot of piano music, and sometimes write music for short films, too. And I'm Andrew Ryan. I played bass in the Brave Little Abacus. Nice. So how would you guys describe Brave Little Ab Abacus? And also, what were the years active? We were active from uh, August 2007 to January 2012. How would you two describe our sound? Jeez. <laughs> uh, I think the people who don't know that's that's listening. Yeah. Um, I think at first we just wanted to sound like the flame who lives. And then whatever else we were listening to, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think we wanted to sound earnest excited loud we just wanted to be uh as creative as possible yeah i'm glad andrew and adam are answering this right now because i wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> first <laughs> we wanted to sound very emotional yeah yeah it was like it, it all like experimental like punk rock that's what we were kind of going for mm. yeah. so, a lot of people uh you like you guys are basically accredited for being like one of the figureheads for like fifth wave emo. Mm. Um yeah, and you guys never really like claim to like be emo, correct? Absolutely not. Yeah, I don't think we claim that. No, we never that never really came about until after the band's breakup. Um when we were in Brave Little Abacus, I think that we actually were really proud that we couldn't define it by a genre. That was really fun. Because we were surrounded by bands that were like, oh, we're um, we're like a post-hardcore mall rock um, outfit from southern <laughs> New Hampshire. And then it would be like, what is your band? And we'd be like, uh, it's Brave Alaskans. We were very, I think we were kind of like indignantly anti-genre. Um, mm -hmm. But I totally get it. And, uh, I, you know, I think there's a lot of music described as emo that just happens to be earnest and loud. And I think we were those things as well so yeah 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 um i saw on um an article you guys were accredited for having the the best emo song in 2010 on the ringer that's crazy play to win yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um what when did you guys like notice uh when your band started to get viral like post-mortem on the internet Mm, it was oh, uh, so, like individually what's your individual stories when you guys were like oh wow like this is we, we talked about it i think so yeah I, like i don't know 2015 or something i don't know i, I would i probably second that it probably around 2015 i was like okay some people seem like they're actually still interested in this maybe more people than knew about it but it wasn't like you know i still didn't know if more people would continue to listen to it it was just like okay it seems like people yeah still listen to it it's it hard was a surprise it's hard it was a surprise yeah it was definitely a surprise 
Yeah, it's really hard to judge too because the attention to it has grown. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, 2015, probably a good base point. But then like, even like by 2018, 2019, 2020, like the attention has grown incrementally like every year. Um, like I, I couldn't believe the first time that just got back from the discomfort got put on spotify we didn't do it somebody oh, else yeah did. yeah <laughs> the the amount of attention that that got was really shocking um because it had previously not been on any streaming services so it's hard to kind of judge it's been a little bit of like an uphill trajectory of monitoring it um it's always surprising though like the ringer article that you're referencing with like the best emo song of 2010 like that was a real weird high point personally like i still yeah, can't believe that that was shocking. you know seeing that band's name on a list with bands the likes of rights of spring and um cap and jazz and you know it's like that's that's wild you yeah. Know? Mm. yeah and i i feel like what puts you guys apart from a lot of the other bands in this genre is just how like how weird you guys are and how um definitely like experimental like uh like you guys would use like the jumping samples of sonic or like a washing machine would make it into your record um what, what were some like weird things that you guys have like have like made it into your records i don't know those those two for sure um how, how did that washing machine even get in the record we were just recording in Adam's uh, parents' basement, so I, it was kind of uh, unavoidable. <laughs> the clothes had to be washed. The wa yeah. yes. wash, yeah. The washing machine is an like a like an actual very honest collaborator because it just is. It was just on. Like constantly going. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. My yeah. Like my folks were just doing laundry, and you know we had the genius idea to have room mic set up in a basement. You know, and it's like. And you guys didn't have like the idea to like turn it off or just like, what were you guys like, let's just keep it rolling. It was probably mid cycle. So, well, I think, <laughs> I think, I think, I think the washing machines involvement in the production of masked dancers specifically is one of the best indicators of how Brave Little Abacus went about making music was that it was such tunnel vision. Like imagine a puppy post like surgery with the cone. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, we're making music. Like we don't, we couldn't possibly have time to worry about like a washing machine mm. being there. I mean, it was just it's it's perfectly imperfect, I guess. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. And uh, you, I'm assuming all of this is all recorded like like at your house, like home recording stuff uh, mainly. What was the uh, the DAW that you guys used at that time? Uh, Cubase SE. It was oh. a student version of Cubase that I got from um. My guitar teacher at the time, Eric Clemenzi, who was very involved in helping us like mix and decide like equipment we would get. He was a huge inspiration. Um, he was he had the genius idea that he was like, you should send an email to Steinberg and request a free student license to Cubase uh, and say you're studying music production. But the reality was I was just in high school. <laughs> so I just sent a picture of my high school like student ID card and said I was studying audio production and they sent me a free version of Cubase SE. So that's what we used. Nice. <laughs> Whole time. Yeah. yeah. The, entire time. the entire time. Yeah. yeah. The, the only... Even even like Ukume? Uh, Ukume was in Cubase, but the drums were made in Reason. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then so I, I would say like your, your Cole album, like uh, just got back. Um, I, I heard that you guys like, like mapped out the entire album before producing it. Is that is that correct? Um, I kind of had. Yeah. Yeah. That record was like, I had written a lot on my own for the first time in the band. So mm -hmm. the, yeah, the kind of the trajectory, like the trajectory of the track listing and stuff, there was ideas there, but a lot of it did actually happen kind of in the moment of yeah. recording. There was a lot of like improvisational elements. Um, so it was a lot. A lot of this, the um, 
the stuff that happens on that record and kind of like in a I don't know, like almost like a storytelling way is a little bit by accident, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I I noticed like a lot of like like callbacks on that record. Like um you'll have like like way before now, uh, like that line and like instrumental melodies would, would have like a like a callback. Um was it was that like on purpose? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah sure. Definitely. So you guys were like trying to like tell a story with uh just got back? Trying to make a cool <laughs> record. Yeah, trying to make yeah, I think, yeah, mostly like trying to, yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of narrative, kind of also just like we listened to a lot of music that did that. Like The Ugly Organ by Cursive. Like that was a record that, you know, Tim Kasher, incredible writer, like would recycle melody and stuff. Like I love that. Like, yeah. Mm. And we jumped at every opportunity to do that. Not, a, not in an over the top way, but. It was just exciting. Yeah. And when it would present itself, it was like particularly fun. It was like, oh, you could do this here. Yeah. Again. Like you can do the boys theme melody in, you know, bug infested floorboards because it works. Why not? Yeah. What does that end up meaning? It was fun, you know? Yeah, it like it definitely like connected. It just made like the whole album just like feel such like a cemented thing. Um you guys, I, I feel like you guys took a lot of like uh I don't know, just so many, there's so many, like, weird moments uh, in your guys' music, like, like, the long drawn out, like, drawn out outro, and, like, the blah, blah, blahs, or, like, the buffalo, like, what, what was, like, the reasoning? What was the inspiration? Was Horny Vampire inspired, basically, that's what I always felt. But... Yeah, the buffalo was definitely, we were seeing, uh, we were going to shows with electronic artists, and um meeting more electronic artists that had uh sequences of songs that were primarily for people to dance to and we wanted people to we used, yeah. we used to dance to it when we would play the buffalo we would all stop playing and it would just be on a backing track and we would just dance <laughs> what i we don't know about this out and stuff yeah but the blah blah blahs that was more um i mean that was i mean you can speak to that better uh, than i can i think I mean, uh, you know, we, we had listened to some different ambient artists, um, including Apex Twin. And um, yeah, sometimes we would just find like a cool chord progression in a song that was neat. And then thought maybe maybe for one moment in the song, like we just hear the chord progression rather than like every other instrument and just sort of meditate on that for a minute. I'm glad you said meditate, because I do think that it was like that was a big thing, like I think people find it really funny how long something happens in a Brave Abacus track. Like I think about like the end of Can't Run Away or like he never existed in the first place. Yeah. But like we kind of liked that. Like what's that track on uh, Hit to Death in the Future Head by the Flaming Lips? That's just like the the delay that's like at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> like we thought it was so cool that bands would like have a track that was just four minutes of the same thing. Mm. it's almost even like a modern classical bit you know like yeah, yeah. like you were listening like i remember when we were in brave abacus like zach was listening to this uh modern i i guess you would call it like an experimental compo composer zanakis oh yeah yeah Z zanakis <laughs> totally great. i mean we're just interested in noise and sound yeah you know i mean like yeah. like it's okay for something to last long if you're if you're not listening to it like if you're interested in listening to the sound of it yeah Mm. my favorite is the outro to the blah 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 so yeah that's my favorite one yeah it's a lot of, yeah, a lot of fun um radiator in it too yeah Spe yeah that, speaking that, of that, like yeah <laughs> the radiator yeah, yeah that did have yeah that did have a noise in the background i remember <laughs> yeah um yeah while we're, while we're talking about can't run away how did you guys even make that ending in can't run away um I'm, super I'm ambient it super is, ambient um, <laughs> no it's uh it's pieces of the song uh time stretched and reversed and manipulated so it's all it's all composed via uh pieces of the previous like performance i could have sworn i heard some like horns in there or something we were i i i i I'll say I was, I think we all were, I would, we were obsessed with time stretching. Yeah. Like when you take like, just like a note on an acoustic guitar, 
and just make it three minutes long, like just completely slow it down. So it lasts forever. Some real magic happens. And that was just having a lot of fun and composing inside a DAW, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 Can't run away. Like when I first heard that, that was like, uh, I don't know. It separated you guys from so many different artists. Um, and also one of my favorite tracks, but I won't always be on the receiving end. That was just such like a literally such like, like a weird track having like an, like an instrumental jam and then just Akira like sampled all throughout the song. Did, yeah. did, but did you guys have like an inspiration behind that or just you guys just like, let's just do it? I mean, we were watching Akira then. I yeah, we, we liked Akira. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, I think. I think the sampling thing was a little bit of a snowball effect where like the first couple times we did it, it was just really exciting. So then every time we did it subsequently, we tried to up the ante kind of. Does that make yeah, any sense? That makes sense to me. Yeah. So it's like taking like an, a vocal from, you know, dialogue from Akira and trying to make it musical. It was just like, how much further can you take it each time, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you guys ended up using the another Akira sample later on in that album i believe it's kind of yeah it's all over the place on mass dancers yeah because it's on like but i won't always be on the receiving end and then uh never exist never at first i think that's it maybe but yeah and then the malcolm in the middle samples all over it just got back oh yeah 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 and was that like a an intentional thing like with the story of just got back I mean, I can say for me personally, it was very connected to the lyrical content. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, while talking about the two albums, what what are the two album covers? Like, what's what's the story be behind those two? Andrew, do you want to describe the Mass Dancers cover? The you were very we, involved. We worked on that. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. yeah. We kind of had the idea for it. We had a friend that had taken a picture of our friend, um, I don't know, with his arms up like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we just had kind of the idea to make it into a silhouette and then post all those leaves in there. We did it at uh, the college, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. just, we just cut up a bunch of trees and cut up a bunch of pictures of trees and glued it on there. Yeah. Yeah, the, the <laughs> tree, a lot of people don't notice because, you know, when you're looking at like an album cover on your phone, it's so small. But the tree in on the cover of Mass Dancers is a collage. It's mm -hmm. like like a hundred different little pictures of different trees I think really on digital yeah camera. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah right yeah, I mean, we, we like, did take the pictures yeah and print, print it out, out and glued them together so yeah. it was a physical collage there was some i don't know where it is yeah. but there was a physical collage of the tree somewhere yeah and then we had our friend james didn't james edit it together yeah james yeah. gentile yeah. All, yeah always did like our photoshop work yeah he did the demo cover too yeah, yeah, the yeah the demo cover the and then the arrangement for Mass Dancers and the scan for the cover of Just Got Back because I didn't have a scanner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the Mass Dancers artwork had a lot of detail and thought put into it, and then the Just Got Back artwork is just a picture I found in my parents' house and we scanned. <laughs> so, so who who's in the picture? Uh, that would be my dad. Oh really? And and he ended up playing your uh, your last show too, right? Yeah, yeah, he played drums when we covered um, uh, American Girl by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Yeah. Was he stoked for that? How'd you guys even ask? He didn't want to do it. Um what? He, yeah, cuz he was you know, he's like kind of like he was like, "Oh, nobody wants to see me play drums." And then what happened was cuz we played that show with our dear friend Laura Stevenson, and when I told him that Laura was going to sing on it, he, like, started to practice and was like, oh, this is the real deal. And he, like, finally agreed to, like, do it. But he wasn't going to do it. It was it was wild. Hmm. So how did the uh, the band name come about? Um, well, we, we I think we wanted to, like, make... We, we had an idea of referencing maybe old media, like maybe an old film or something. We we, we went through a couple different films. We were like something that had nostalgia, like um, we were thinking of something related to the never ending story at one point, I remember. Uh, and then um, we had also seen The Brave Little Toaster 
We really love the Brave Little Toaster. Hmm. A lot. And there was something about, yeah, there was just something about the the vibe of that movie that felt like just neat and different. And uh, yeah, we just had the idea of just changing up the the noun with something interesting. I don't know. We just had to think of like an interesting noun. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the Brave Little Toaster's like involvement in Brave Little Abacus is like a lot bigger than I think <laughs> anyone would ever really know. Like Zach and I particularly, and tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, like, say, yeah. like I still am obsessed with the score to that movie, as I can only assume you. Yeah, are. yeah, the score is ridiculous. It's one of just... yeah, one of the greatest collections of music ever. It was a huge uh, connective point, I think, for how we would write together yeah um so i i went on to reddit before i did this interview um like two weeks ago i posted on reddit like hey i got brave little abacus down to meet up for an interview like would you be down to post some questions emo reddit blew up with that um well yeah my post blew up and i was like swarmed with questions um yeah, I, I haven't had a post that big before. So I was like, all right, all right, come out. Uh, uh, but um, everyone, so yeah, I'm going to be asking some questions that I got from Reddit. Um, first, what was your guys' uh, influences, like personal influences uh, during like the, the band? You want to go down the line? Andrew, you want to start? Sure. I think um, in the beginning, it was definitely, we, you've talked about it before, but uh, They Might Be Giants and the Flaming Lips. Um, and then I think as it got further on, definitely cursive. I got more into bright eyes. Um, we were always going through a bunch of music, I guess. Yeah. I remember the, the day that you started showing me microtonal music. I wouldn't say that was my biggest influence, but uh, I just remember that becoming a big yeah, We listened to, to it a ton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We listened to, we, we were just always showing each other music and listening to new things together. It was a constant revolving, like, uh, playlist of new music. Yeah. And I remember you showed me a, uh, Mountain uh, the microphones. Yeah, the microphones. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we were we we definitely listened to the the glow for a minute. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah, I was listening to or Bruce Pizzer. No, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was listening to a lot of um Alois Haba, uh, microtonal twentieth century composer, and just a lot of like atonal twentieth century music, primarily at that time. But then Adam and Andrew were my uh, link to the the future with rock <laughs> bands. <laughs> yeah. Like, they were showing me, yeah, a lot of more modern stuff. I'm going to go with some deep cuts. I don't think I've ever said before. Um, loved The Shape of Punk to Come by Refused. Oh, that yeah, record yeah. was a big yeah. one. Um, Sirens by On the Might of Princes, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary right now. And it, a new remaster has just come out, um, which is awesome. And it's been incredible to revisit that record because it had such a profound impact. That was like the platonic ideal of like vocal performance. A lot of people uh, think my voice is bad on those records. I was just trying to sound like Jason Rosen Rosenthal from On the Might of Princes. I didn't do a very good job. Uh, <laughs> um, what else? Uh, I always say it, but it's like the truth. Bond the music industry was such yeah. a guiding yeah. force for us of not only what to sound like as a band, but how to be a band. Um, we loved Lemuria. Yeah, true. We loved The Measure. We loved Good Luck. The Wild. Yeah. The Wild. Um, uh, Lantidum, uh, New Hampshire based, um, uh, I guess people would call them scrams. Uh, I always just <laughs> called them punk rock. Uh, their, their, Lantidum's discography is recently, um, gone to streaming services. So hopefully younger people can hear those records too um yeah there we yeah. were we i think we were good listeners we were good <laughs> at hanging out and listening to music and it was it was good for us you know mm -hmm. yeah um and then so i have uh some question or i have a question for uh zach and andrew first uh someone asked uh zach uh what what synths were you using during uh brave little abacus and then do you have any advice for like like making presets. Unfortunately, <laughs> I unfortunately I don't have any advice for making presets because we 
we uh we use the presets on um the Elisis Micron almost I mean almost exclusively like yes there were there are some other synths thrown in we use we sampled organs and other keyboards but like I primarily use the Elisis Micron and we we manipulated the the presets on that keyboard but I I'm not I I don't I don't uh I don't design since myself. So I, I, I apologize. Like I've gotten this question. I've gotten this question a lot, but we we just uh th that keyboard has a really nice interface for modifying yeah. sounds and mm -hmm. uh but no, I don't. So something like like the blah blah blahs that would be just a, a preset from Micron? We 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 manipulated it a little bit, but we would uh we 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 would Adam and I would normally go through like when we were figuring out the synth for a song and we would find like uh you know a couple sounds that we liked and then we would always just have a discussion of maybe what how we needed to change it like maybe it needed to sound softer or maybe the attack needed to be slower or you know maybe there could be a cool effect to it like i really liked using the pitch wheel a lot so usually i would mess with the pitch wheel but aside from that maybe like with the sliders maybe uh like an eq slider or um, an octave slider or maybe like changing the sound so Usually we would hone the sound a little bit and then come up with a couple different uh, ways we can manipulate the sound with like uh, sliders, um, mm -hmm. pedals too. True, yeah, like true. on Just Got Back, there's like a lot of guitar pedals. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. you know, delay pedals. And then for Andrew, um, what was like the the general tunings that you use on your bass? Someone said that you strictly only use D standard for the songs. No, it that's was. True. Mostly Standard tuning or, or drop D, yeah. So mm. that was it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we were never smart enough to detune the bass to what the guitar was. Because yeah. the guitar <laughs> got tuned down a whole step, but we weren't like, just tune the bass down too. It was like, no, you got to like learn it. We're just going to learn it. Yeah, it's going to be totally different. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then I'm sure you guys get this all the time. This is like, whenever I have interviews, like this is like the number one question from like Reddit uh is there going to be a vinyl release andrew is there going to be a vinyl release of the brave black is this back is there going to be a vinyl release you're playing coy right now andrew I think <laughs> one day there will be I, I i myself work at a record store i don't know if um record buyers or listeners of the brave Abacus know this but the music industry is in a time of flux it's in a period of great transition and it is extremely difficult to press wax right now. Um, we may do it in the future. Right now would not be an economically opportune time to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, it's not something that's ever been like off the table. It just is, it's extremely cost prohibitive. Yeah. And I think uh, like sometimes, it, you know, I guess I'm kind of playing into my gimmick here a little bit. But like sometimes people who like old bands, they forget that some of the old bands they like, like come from a lot of money. <laughs> like... That's true. That's definitely true. And that's like the, the big difference with a lot of like emo bands. It was it was really just like kids with like usually like pirated software or something like that. Just yeah. yeah. Um, I did have I did have someone on Reddit like I have people asking about the vinyl, and then someone bugging me on Reddit like, please, I need. Their Instagrams. I want to print vinyl for them, so I could give you their their information if needed. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we've got people have reached out like with stuff like that, but it's like to be honest, I'd rather just do it in house when it's the right time and the right mm -hmm. context. But I think it'll happen one day. Mm -hmm. I do. And do you guys have any um like unreleased material? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I think we released it all. Right? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Last question from Reddit. Uh, do you guys have like any plans on like making new music or or touring again? Well, we never toured. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think it would be a fun thing to explore. Yeah. I, yeah, there's no plans, but yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, if that's where we're at. I mean, Kyle, you are uh, instrumental in in getting the the ball rolling on that conversation. 
I'll I'll find a way. I'll find a way. Are you if you guys are open to it, I'll find a way. <laughs> I'll just put it on the the Reddit forum again and guaranteed. Um, it's weird. Like I like I found on like Twitter like people like talking about like oh my god there's conversation that brave little advocates is just meeting up together like people are so thirsty about this i want to take this opportunity to call out chill wave records Ch chill wave records standing on our shoulders i see them i'm not on twitter but people send it to me i saw them tweeting that we were reuniting when it wasn't true i saw them tweeting about this interview chill wave i see you i know what you're doing. <laughs> all right you know where to find me in Roslindale, Massachusetts. Uh, so uh, what was, personally, what was your guys' uh, favorite song that you made? Also, we have about eight and a half more minutes left in this uh, free Zoom call. Okay. Nice. We got a couple songs that long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to play? Uh, I'll go, I guess I'll go first. Yeah. If, you know. Uh, it's like we're at the 99 and I'm like, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't, I don't have too many questions left. I don't have too many questions uh, left. Uh, my favorite <laughs> song that we ever made was orange, blue is stripes. <clears throat> yeah. And what, what was that? Um, it was the last track that we worked on on just got back. And I felt that we were like really maturing in our process. And I was just really proud of it at the time. I remember the feeling of feeling really accomplished that we had achieved it. And I just thought, um, I don't know. I think I could listen to an entire Brave Little Advocates record that just sounded like Orange Blue with Stripes. Mm -hmm. It would have been cool to see if we could ever have made one, you know? Yeah, mm. yeah it was a very special process in making it. So that's why it's my my favorite. And what about you guys? Um, Definitely one of the most fun songs to play on the synth was 45 minutes and also the fact that adam found a way to incorporate the american tale soundtrack we just loved the james horner songs so much so that that was one of the most fun maybe, yeah maybe maybe my favorite one to play i was gonna say that as well that and um untitled continued oh, I like that oh that's my favorite song yeah no. i feel like that song is very slept on wake them up mm. <laughs> um so i mean i i saw on um, like that matt aspenwall uh split set video on um, and just like the uh, like that the live video of you guys playing uh with matt aspenwall was just so like wholesome what was like the uh the scene like back back then like the local scene small very small it was uh I would say maybe a group of like 50 ish people that would come and go and faces that we knew and people that we knew pretty tight. Um, it was us and different bands basically. And, uh, friends of ours that were playing, um, we, most of the shows we would put on or go play with, with other people that we knew. Yeah. And I, I, it's funny. Like I, the two things I would always describe about it, if anyone ever asked is one, it was a shock when there was someone around that you didn't know. Yeah. And it was like a trip. Like you had to, you were like, who is that? How are they here? And then B, a real testament to what it was like to be in Brave Abacus was the constant confusion between us and our social circles that it was like, oh no, it's, this is a show. It's not a party. <laughs> yeah. Like the amount of Brave Abacus shows that would end because the people at the party were like, we're done with the music part. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Or got uh, shut down. Oh yeah, shut yeah. Down. constant oh, yeah. house shows getting shut down. Yeah, but no, there was it was a scene of creative people and friends, but it it was very small, yeah. very small. Hmm. Hmm. Um, this is a, like a very personal question. What what inspired the chord organ on the uh, record? Um, I, we, we would get all sorts of instruments that we get offline, I feel like, or, um, at thrift at, shops, at thrift shops yeah, we always thrifted instruments. Yeah. Flea markets. From, yeah. That one, the quarter organ was borrowed, Cody? but I think it would, I think the 
if you really have to trace, if you really want to trace back the genesis of it, it's it's Daniel Johnson. Yeah, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. I would I would say he's like like the biggest uh mainstream use of a chord organ. It was just it was just so weird to hear a chord organ like actually used on a on a track. Um do you guys have any like uh tips for songwriting? Like how would you guys like how would a song kind of get composed? Like where did where did it start? I feel like you would have the majority of the idea and we would come together on it. Yeah. 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 Just kind of going going full like full in on on like a small idea and then being ready to bring it to the rest of the band and see what we can add to it. Always mm-hmm. trying to make it as exciting and like large as possible. Yeah. So where where are you where are you guys off to like uh musically now? I know you just had a release. Yeah, yeah. I um, I I still like to record piano music and instrumental music, and uh, every once in a while, release some collections of piano music. And um, in my spare time, I also uh, like writing scores for animated films. Um, so yeah, it's it's really fun for me. What about the rest of you guys? I'm in a band called Me and Capris that has some new stuff coming out uh at some point and uh yeah it's been uh been in that band for a while it's fun to see live we really got to get the bla fans out to uh, the northeast to see me and capri's live okay. it'll be fun because i ain't i ain't going there but they, <laughs> they could come to me <laughs> no i'm kidding uh yeah no i uh still writing all the time playing all the time hmm. and then are, are you uh in a band currently andrew no, not at all. So was uh, BLA the like the last band that you're in? Yeah. Mm. So yeah. how did um Ukame uh come to fruition? I think before we before we go to that, Zach, you yeah, were gonna Zach. add something. Oh, oh I, I completely just spaced in the moment and I wanted to mention that I also collaborate with um my friend James or our friend James. Um we have a duo together and we uh we write instrumental uh I, I really don't know what genre it is, but it's like <laughs> it's got Sweet. guitar and piano and strange electronic sounds and uh, soundscapes. Um, it's called Few, and we're working on a collection together. Um, it's a, uh, I guess it would be our first album length collection. Hopefully, coming together sometime this year. T H E. I'm I'm really excited for that. And the one that helped with the the mass dancers. Oh yeah, they, or, sorry, they, they yeah they they um, yeah um, yeah they did. all connect. They, they, yeah, they also um, are a photographer and have been they documented most of our yeah. like, a lot of our bands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, how did a uh, ukame uh, happen? I think it was primarily through. The uh, you know, it's kind of a funny story, but friends of ours started an independent label and wanted to put out a seven inch by us. And so they told us that we had to make shorter songs uh, and <laughs> fit it onto a seven inch record and they would put it out. And that's how it happened. Yeah, it was. It's really I don't know if it would have happened if Cat Dead Details Later didn't start. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like that is all my time that I have. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for being here. Wait, wait, I have something to show you guys. I have something to show you guys. This is exciting. Could this be Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I got the. The chord organ. Nice. nice. Sweet. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thanks for inspiring this this hang we get to have. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Cool. All right. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day today. Yeah, you too. You too, Kyle. Bye. All right. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye.